I can just start. I can do it. Okay. So good morning. It's uh, 10 a.m. in lovely Czech Republic. Everybody had a hangover from yesterday's party, I guess. No, we're still at home. Uh, maybe next year. So operate first. Um, how to open source cloud operations. That's something that we touched on yesterday at, uh, at the keynote. I don't know how many of you have been there. I talked about it last year. I talked about it at DEFCONF. That's something that I've been working on for the last 1.5 years or two years or so. And it evolved from one idea into something larger than that. Maybe it's I have confirmation bias or something, um, but I think it's actually uh, a paradigm change, a something to re-envision open source in the cloud age. And I will talk a little bit about the philosophical underpinnings, how we came to that conclusion, um, where it all started, and well, basically the the the, the mindset behind Operate First and what it actually means. And then um, I will go into the state of state of the systems, the state of the community cloud that we are actually running. So it's not just something that we talk about, but it's something that we actually prototype and implement, which doesn't mean that we should be the only ones implementing it. So it's really a call out to action and a uh, fishing for, for new members in that community and contributors. And finally, I'll also talk about community metrics, how the community is composed and on what trajectory, what trajectory we are. This is my corporate picture. I'm a senior manager at Red Hat in the office of the CTO. So that's super nice because we can play on things, uh, play with things uh, that are completely open and that envision how the state of affairs looks like in five years from now. So it's it's a little bit of a startup culture um, and playing with toys and stuff. I'm working on open services and how well open source can impact services. I worked on AI and I've worked on AI ops. I think all mesh very well together. Without AI in the future, I don't think services will work. Anyways, this is uh, my picture on the internet. I'm a, what does it say? Old school open source hacker and demon zombie slayer um, at B format and Red Hat's office of the CTO. So mm -hmm. that's to get some credibility from the cool kids. Going back, I don't know how many of you saw that uh, um, thing like, what is it 30 40 years ago i certainly did not uh, as a grown up i i did an internship at ibm and i was when i was like 11 years old and they took me into the mainframe room and there were these these cabinet sized machines and only with one terminal and actually that's that's what computers were like you would order a a large rack a large set of machines ibm would deliver them and uh, you had this interface to these machines and you could pick up the phone and say, IBM, I need more uh, compute power. And they would go into the machine and um, enable one more CPU or one more something. And the only thing that you got was that, that manual to interact with the machine. And that basically sucks because uh, you are just a user. So you cannot really innovate on top of it beyond the manual and beyond what the vendor allows you to it and we all know this story then linus torward said oh i actually want to hack on that stuff um this manual has defined system calls so i would just re-implement those system calls and um hello my name is linus torvalds and i pronounce linux as linux so that happened and that sprawled this whole open source community, free software, and people got together and innovated on top of it because suddenly we had this contributor funnel. We had people that just used the software that, um, let's say 100 people used the software and then people were asking, so how can I contribute? And they, maybe they write an issue, maybe they talk to the community and the community 
um, people that actually implement stuff do those fixes or maybe they contribute their fixes themselves so you have a funnel where out of 10 out of 100 people using the software maybe one person actually contributes and um, contributes code to the software not saying that um, the other contributions on top don't matter they all matter because you also need users as a as, as a as a feedback pool but open source actually made it possible so that the contributions flow right into the into the code now today we are in a similar situation the age of cloud has dawned on on us uh, the age of scale i think we're going back to mainframes how many people can run an actual production setup on their computers i'm not using a local mail client anymore i'm using a, a web-based mail client i'm using documents in the cloud basically i could just use a tablet to do all my day-to-day -day work although i still have a, a a beefy machine to do some coding from time to time but it's still only small parts of the whole setup that i'm doing locally and I'm then deploying into the cloud so you will never run a whole setup on your machine and if so it's always in a in a in a, in a downscaled version of sad software so the times where we just did configure make and then we had the full stack running locally those are gone and in order to develop against a cloud setup you want to have that stuff always running so suddenly availability scale performance basically everything that touches operations becomes equally important if not more important to you or to users because in the end it doesn't matter whether you are coding against a postgresql database a mysql database or a redshift database from aws you worry about a database that is available that you can use and this is a tweet from a person Matt Assay um, who was working at AWS I think he moved on and he said uh, what happens if you open source everything that's exactly what Yagabyte they are doing a, a I think the database um, thing um, did when it dumped open core to instead release all of its code as open source software so they were not selling just parts and they were not distributing just parts of their software as open source like the open core model but everything is open source which is great so suddenly you're not trying to to uh, make money out of a reduced feature set or an expanded feature set which is enterprise ready but you're basically giving everything to the community um offering customers a managed service how is it going blah 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 and if you but if you really look closely is everything really everything no the important part why and how they can make money from their software and it's good that they make money out of their software is um not the code not the features of the software itself but it's the availability of the software so that they are offering it as a as a managed service to customers and that they operate it and they certainly did not open source their operations. So you cannot go into Yagabyte's back office and look at the issues there, why the API call didn't perform good. The only thing that you can do is file an issue, say, hello, this is running slow, or this is canceling with a 404 error or five something error. Um, can you please look into it? So it essentially trains this nice funnel that we had previously so you can still use the software you can still use the service but you're basically stopped at the boundary of contribution i even bet that the issues that we're opening against those nice services running in the cloud are not open because only only the back office can see them so i cannot see into which issues other people ran for that cloud service 
unless they may be posted on Stack Overflow or someplace else. So I'm essentially limited with these hyperscalers, which is bad. So that's the bold statement that I put out there. If the value in IT is in ops and ops are proprietary, then open source has a problem. And that's how we how we started out with this operate first paradigm. We needed to build operability into our software. And essentially also to, um, well, uh, to ship software to customers so that customers don't run into issues that, um, that the community or the people that built the software might, might run into. So basically shift left in your development cycle, um, include development, include QE into, into your development pipeline really as early as possible to understand and to discover operational problems, to fix them before you ship them, and to also deliver software more in a, in a, in a service, in a cloud fashion, where we have updates and upgrades continuously and not just release cycles every quarter or every 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 year you get a new update which fixes bugs no but you want to have continuous integration and continuous deployment maybe also for the for the for the software that just works over the air so operating something um, your software in a cloud environment in a cloud native environment in a hybrid cloud environment as people as operators doing stuff and then codify it as operational codify the operational knowledge build it into the software people from the cloud native world know this term of operators i think it's just a concept how we codify this operational knowledge boom to so say it in another in in more um, in, in another way, operate first is a concept or an initiative to operate software in a production grade environment, bringing users, developers, and operators closer together. And at Red Hat, we try to establish operate first as a basic tenet, just like we have upstream first as our one of our tenets, one of our principles, how we operate and how we how we build code, how we build software. Now, one part, one fun part of working in the office of the CDO is that you can re-envision stuff and you can take a step back and think about what are we doing here exactly. And I think it's really using the power of open source and apply that to these new domains to operations and to data and maybe also to um, even higher up the stack. So in this case, open source applied to that context means that you have read only access to all the data. That means issues, that means metrics, that means logs, that means deployment artifacts basically like you can have all access to uh, to all data all artifacts regarding a software setup a, a so software project you can read the github issues you can read down to the code you can see their build pipelines in a cloud setup in an in a deployment all the data expands to exactly this logs, support issues, incidents, um, but also making it really easy to onboard people. So don't, don't stop or don't uh, uh, require really, really specific knowledge for people to come to your community, but also embrace just users of your service and make it easy for them to to, to grow into power users, grow into contributors. 
and have something for the power users already. So on that whole scope of beginners to experts, you need to embrace people coming to you. And essentially to establish that, that contributor funnel, read, report and resolve issues. So on the community side, um, what personas are we targeting? It's certainly those that operate the platform, that operate um, software, the, the, the workloads on that platform, the software stack running there, the developers that develop parts of the platform. So a Kubernetes developer would be part of that community, but also somebody who develops a workload running in that um, community. People that use the software, because without users, it would be a sad deployment. Nobody would use it and you, uh, you wouldn't run into those edge cases, right? So you need to expose it to people because they will click the buttons in an unexpected way. Product support, meaning doc, that's, that, that also encompasses documentation. And um, so really find something out about the user experience. Maybe it's not so obvious how you would envision this feature to be used. Architects, software architects. Um, I think it's more like Lego bricks these days where you where you build something new for a new vertical or a new use case and you take bits and pieces and just stick them together differently, put some glue in there. And um, usually we do that with a dedicated demo environment for a use case where you have to build out these 80% um, from the bottom. And in this environment, you can mix and match stuff and have it long running in the community environment. And finally, also my beloved AI ops spots so that at some point they do most of the tedious work and the chores and we can enjoy funnier stuff. No, that's not uh, even that stuff is also funny, but even greater stuff. I don't know. <laughs> so, um, it's in one in one sentence it's a hybrid cloud environment with full visibility into the operations center it's something that you can really touch and this is this url where you should go to operate-first.cloud that's your entry point into our system so what are our systems the environment consists or we started out with a bare metal deployment at the massachusetts open cloud moc that's a university um, or a collection of universities in boston university in boston and that's like i think it's 20 nodes with some beefy cpu so it's 150 cores or maybe 300 cores i'm not 100% sure, but it's it's not not small. And we extended that to a deployment in, in Germany, where we have some cloud bare metal deployments. And we have deployments running in AWS. So it's already a hybrid because bare metal on premise install and cloud install and multi geo because US cloud and EMEA uh, deployment. So that's pretty advanced. And we're extending that to other universities and other clouds. Now, that's already super, super, uh, super cool that you have such an environment which is operated um, in such a fashion. You can see how people are running clusters, how they are deploying and managing clusters. But you also want to run stuff there. And we started out with Open Data Hub uh, because of the a shared history with the team that initially started this environment and because we had users there. So in, um, Open Data Hub is being operated at scale in that environment. We always upgrade to the latest and greatest version and we have users using this environment. And although it's a non-SLA environment, uh, which can go down at any time 
we still have some nines of uptime so people can actually work there we have project thoth running there which is ai guided dependency management and uh, um, software stack resolution and which also contributes um, ci cd pipelines and bots for your day-to-day -day software development needs we have some stuff out of the Python and the Java world, APQRIO, APQRIO Quarkus, and, and Pulp, which is a Python index, all running in that environment and, and, and used. So actual stuff there. And in order to deploy and manage those workloads, we obviously need management and automation. So we, we are creating and curating an environment where GitOps is, is, is uh, lived and, and practiced with a, with a mindset that is forward-looking, where we say, okay, let's do it right and don't care about legacy system. We can always, we can always um, scrap it and, and try out something new where we think the the future is going to and where the best practices are leading to. So we're using Advanced Cluster Manager for deploying clusters. We're using Argo CD for deploying workloads. And we're using Prow for um, CI jobs. We're using Tecton for um, CI pipelines, etc. And we try to treat everything as a service and embrace the concept of operators because that's where the future is going to and that's how you would deliver parts of your project in a more stable production environment you would need to have you would have a hard time convincing your operators to run a better version of an operator here you can just contribute that op operator deploy that operator with the pro uh, with the ops team and see if it breaks probably it doesn't break the whole setup Otherwise, you would roll back and offer that service, offer that operator as a as a platform service to users or to power users yourself and get uh, immediate feedback. And last but not least, and I think that's the most valuable part because it encompasses this notion of we want to share knowledge. We want to uh, act as a catalyst of a community where you come to it and see how stuff is being practiced so you would see those blueprints those best practices documented how to manage um how to manage secrets in your in your setup how to do alerting for a multi-cluster setup all these decisions are noted down and are captured in architectural decision this decision records to go back to and either read up for your future self or if you need to set up such an environment and the operational data that's being captured there all the metrics all the logs all the incidents are also there and people that want to train ais or models can use these as a data set for doing AI ops. Or if you have a similar problem that you're running into, you would Google it and maybe you are directed to a GitHub issue where we already debugged a similar problem and you can follow along to the postmortem of that issue, how we recovered and maybe fix it for yourself. So. I'm not aware of anything like that where you would have a larger set of actual operational data available for free, um, which is not just a snapshot of, of um, revised data from a, from a setup, but it, that's long running data available of a real production environment. Where, where we're at data and metrics of the current state of affairs. Um, I re-ran these, these numbers or hammer 
rerun these numbers, I cannot execute Jupyter notebooks anymore. That's how far of a senior or senior or old manager I became. Um, so these are the metrics from 2021. We have still 26 repositories in our community and the number of external contributors versus internal contributors actually increased. So a couple of months back, we had like 80 to 20 and now it's more like 90 to 10 as a, as a ratio, which is great. So 232 external contributors plus 28 internal contributors makes a total size of 250 people running in this uh, or working in this, in this, um, community <laughs> and we have a we have a steady line of issues uh, or an, an increasing line of uh, issues there so it's luckily it's not a hockey curve so it would become uh, unsustainable at some point but it's a a nice and steady slope going to the upper right we had a, we had a peak in in january but it's probably because people are coming back from the PDO and realizing, oh, I need to actually, uh, my new re New Year's resolution is to open more issues. I don't know, but it's 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 going up. So we have like um, 150 issues per month being being created. And this is the numbers across repositories. So obviously the apps repository. This is where we store all the or the deployment manifests, basically the whole setup of the whole cloud environment has the most churn. Um, there are 1,500 issues created over that, over that time. Um, and then the support repository, that's number three here, has also some good, uh, good issues, um, good numbers. And the orange part is the external contributors versus the was it the internal let's see yes orange is internal which is not which is wrong here so orange is the external part and um blue is the internal part so you you see most of the oh yeah two minutes i, I will make it in two minutes um Obviously, you see most external contributions in the apps repository for people onboarding their stuff and for people asking questions in, this, in the support repository. And contributors by issues, that's a similar pie chart than previously. That's a little bit in the reverse, where most of the people internally in that community are working on the issues. So here we have an 80 to 20 balance, 20 people external, um 20 percent of the external people actually working on issues and 80 percent of the internal people working on these issues which is normal and uh, which might be also not so true because at some point somebody external just is invited to the uh, github org and becomes an internal person so that will probably always stay the same that ratio so now it's the call to action go to operate-first.cloud and just browse around if you are um, familiar with exploring github projects that's not different we have these github orgs and you see the issues and see what's going on there and you can deploy demos because the only thing that you need is a github account to access all the clusters so you can go there right now uh, with your github account and go to the web console of an open shift cluster this is the website. This is your entry point for a developer. This is the entry point for a operator, for an SRE person. And up there in the corner, the black and white issues, not visible with bad eyesight, but the, the um, matrix one is the pop-up for the open shift clusters, for the clusters, the GitHub icon, the Slack icon, and our YouTube channel, which has also a lot of content boom that's it thank you thank you marshall uh, for your amazing talk and i hope re I, my mic mic is clear <laughs> yes your your audio is clear now that's much better 
thank you for listening and thank you for showing up so early. Yeah. We, had... we had one question, but it was already answered in your slides. Yes. So I think we're good. Thanks again. Good. Have a, have a nice day. You too. And looking forward to see you in person next year. Bye-bye.